So hello everybody, I'm uh, Miura Mandaya and it's my pleasure to chair this uh, session. The very first one uh, on uh, uh, more uh, and all of them are linked to Active Planet which is uh, the theme of our uh, meeting this year. So, um, as you know, uh, the Earth is really a very active planet, not uh, only uh, on uh, uh, its surface, with uh, land area, with uh, oceanography, with atmosphere and climate, but also what's happened inside our planet. And of course, our planet is not alone. Uh, we are in a solar system, which is also uh, very much active. And uh, of course, we are very much interested to understand what's happened on. And uh, this also for our wish to understand our planet and our solar system. So for science itself, but also very much for societal uh, benefits because we are a part of this planet. We are here and it's really important to understand what's happened on. And for this, of course, we need observations. Of course, we need to develop tools to understand these observations. And we need also to interpret what's happened. And for this active planet, we have four exceptionally well-known uh, scientists. And they accepted to be here with us during this week and uh, to tell us about different parts of this very active planet. And uh, we will start today with our very first uh, guest, which is uh, Anies Buyajus. And we are really very ha happy to uh, uh, the fact that she accepted this uh, invitation, knowing that uh, his agenda is really very, very busy, mainly this week. Uh, but she's here. Thanks a lot, really, Antje, for everything you have done. Uh, and in a few words, uh, Antje, so she is working now at Alfred Benegger Institute uh, with the Helmholtz Association in Germany. Uh, she has really a very broad area of research from uh, Poland and marine research, but also going deep in uh, sea uh, ecology and uh, technology, also marine microbiology and carbon cycle and uh, methane cycle. So this is important also for us to understand everything linked to climate change. Lots of projects and of course uh, maybe the very uh, awarding one, it's ABIS, an ERC uh, grant. And uh, actually, uh, Antti is a professor in uh, uh, geomicrobiology. And she has lots of hobbies. And uh, maybe citizen people is very important because we are here in Vienna. And maybe it's one of your preferred cities as well. And people, all people around here in the room because they are very nice to be here with you. And um, what you are interested in, and I hope you are going to bring us with you in a travel. Uh, first of all, of course, to go to the Arctic and to see what's happened with Arctic ecosystems, and uh, which are the consequences of very rapid sea ice melt for this very r important region. And uh, maybe you also will have time to bring us uh, uh, deep uh, into the oceans and to see what's happened with uh, marine microorganisms, uh, very important in uh, governing the fluxes uh, of the earth. So um, we have uh, the chance to have you here for more than one hour and uh, the floor is yours and uh, thanks again. And uh, thanks much for, for being here. So when uh, I was asked by Nuara to, to give this plenary um, on the active outer shell of Earth, I was first a bit uh, amazed that um, I was asked to help with putting together the pictures of the active planet outside. You see this big landscape where we all can put our photos, our favorite photos from our favorite landscapes, our favorite uh, work and ourselves. So this picture is growing, so what?
can I, as a deep sea researcher, really contribute to it? Because when you think active outer shell, I don't think the first thing that comes to your mind is the deep sea, but that's my work. I go deep into the ocean and I think about the slowness of life, life in the cold, life remote from our human activity, not so remote anymore. So humans have been in the abyss since the 60s. The deepest divers uh, into the Mar Mariana Trench were happening before men could fly to the moon. So one of these extreme pictures you get from Earth and how it's working is, is really from going deep and exploring how life can actually make a living down there. But to really think about the active outer shell, at the very same time, a completely different perspective of Earth arose. And here you see the original footage from the first astronauts of the Apollo 10 crew in 1969, two years after I was born. And uh, when you go on the internet and you look at this video, it's fantastic because you hear them screaming. It's the first time that people take this look on planet Earth. It's just rising here. And it looks small, bluish. It looks active. You see the clouds. You see some of the oceans. And uh, when the astronauts are photographing, they apparently tearing on the cameras. Each one wants to make a photograph and document this moment. This, this was then shown on television. And I remember, um, even as small as I was at that time, how my parents were sitting there always when there was anything transmitted from Apollo. This was the, the greatest to look at. And people discovered how small and how strange our little planet is. So at that time, this, this whole concept of carbon and life, that's the topic of my plenary today, carbon and life interactions that really got changed the way people looked at carbon and life interactions just because of these images. So I thought this concept of EGU to have a big map of all of us on images to think about how science brings forward pictures and how pictures and graphs can change our conception as scientists or as laymen alike. This is a really cool thing. And so just two words on this, on this uh, publication, the quest for Gaia. So the concept of James Lovelock in 75 then, with this picture in mind, we can look at Earth as a whole. And we should ask ourselves, 75, so before we had the concept of, of uh, climate change and all of that, is our planet Earth not one system that we should look at? When you go back to that article, I'm sure, I'm, I don't know how many of you have read that article. Just very few. How many of you know the Gaia hypothesis? Most, not all, see? So our great ideas, they vanish, but they're also there. So for all of us today, it would be very, clear to think and speak about a concept that is called the system Earth or Earth system or Earth ecosystem. But at that time, James Lovelock and his colleagues, they were really uh, thought a little bit lunatics, a little bit esoteric, a little bit strange for the way they discussed how Earth could be one system, all the rocks, all the elements, all the life on it. And what, of course, the curious thing they also proposed was their second hypothesis that life really defines the material conditions that are needed for survival and makes sure that they stay there. So the second hypothesis, I cannot really show things here with the mouse, but difficult here. Look at that. This, this was caused an uproar and that's what was uh, defeated by many geoscientists saying, oh, what a nonsense, this is contradictory to evolution. Of course, life is not defining the material conditions on Earth and is not defining survival and the longevity of planet Earth. And today we stand there and we still haven't really decided what it is. So of course, life is amazing and life has changed the face of Earth. On the other hand, we are thinking often that it's just a bunch of egoistic genes hopping around this planet and maybe in the end, some of these egoistic genes will destroy Earth. There's also another picture from us geoscientists that is much discussed at this conference when I browse the sessions and abstracts. Um, of course, uh, active outer shell of Earth is where we live, hence we give it a lot of focus. But on the other hand, there is this thin Earth crust only that comprises 1% of the planet's total composition that we are worrying so much about. Maybe it all doesn't really matter and we should really focus on the 99% of the planet that is not this thin outer shell. But of course we must worry and so I would like to remind you about this thin shell concept and life in it. So that's the focus of my talk, because whenever I think planet Earth, I think it's still the only planet that we know of that has life on it. 
the only planet that we say has intelligent life. If we think that life is elsewhere, we don't know. No one ever tried to make contact to us. But this amazing bit of this thin shell and life that changes everything for us, this is a concept that is really, by now, has a part of all of the geosciences. So the furthest I can go in my research and in your research to really span this bridge of thinking active planet, thinking carbon, and thinking life and interactions is two big questions. On the one hand, the question of the origin and dispersal of life, and what do we know about life? Do we know all about life today, having looked at it for so very long? And, of course, the question of the dynamics, the activity, where does it lead us? What role do we humans play in the future of planet Earth? And I try to connect two bridges by the concept of life and what we know about it. So, another famous uh, uh, book I hope that everyone knows of and has read is that where Charles Darwin thinks about evolution and where he already says how he imagines that life would emerge. This concept of how life emerged, where life originates from, has been there as, as long as humans have actually thought about themselves. So when you go back to the ancient Greeks, when you read Aristoteles, he actually was convinced that life is just a cookbook recipe. It's emerging by itself. It has emerged by itself. At the Greeks' time, they thought it always emerges by itself constantly, so they didn't have the concept of germs and progeny and all of that. But this big idea that in the beginning there was nothing, and by abiogenic, um, chaotic encounters, it was possible to form life. This was a great hypothesis that we always followed and still are dealing with today. Charles Darwin thought about his little warm pond. Many others th are thinking today about universe, are thinking about comet ice, are thinking about Mars and meteorites. Many of us still think about Earth, but we haven't made, we have made some progress, but we didn't solve this problem. So is this not the biggest question there is for all sciences? How did life emerge and how did it disperse? Where is it coming from and where is it going to? When we think about the mineralogist's perspective and just think element table, then we have to realize that life is composed of a few minerals. The ones in green here are the basic elements of life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. This is what life is, and then there are a couple of essential trace elements, and we know most of them. Sometimes we find a weird enzyme in an organism with a rare earth mineral or so in it, but some of them can be replaced. So it seems a few elements are enough to actually cook life together. You know how the geoscientists, in fact, more than the life sciences, for many, many decades, have tried to think about cooking life when you think um, Miller-Urey experiment, when you think uh, our attempts to find life in rocks, in ancient rocks, to find ancient rocks uh, foremost, but then also to prove that there is life in it, the upper left one is this famous Greenland most ancient rock with the little black dots that we think could be some evidence for early life. The meteorites that fly in, for, for which we know that fly in the building blocks of life, components of life, all of this work is ongoing but we still haven't really managed to understand what life is and how it comes to pass. A beautiful, simple explanation for the choice of elements in life was made by Paul Falkowski and his colleague. They say, well, look at the distribution of elements on Earth. It's just life is just the most abundant elements that are lying around. Of course, this should be then life. But then we struggle. So in a way, we can look at the elements that make up life. Carbon is the most basic one. And then we can think about how that life is actually the same. All the life that we know from the simple organisms to the most advanced ones are made from carbon. Why is that so? Carbon is an interesting element. It is very flexible. It can make all of these different structures. It can bond with very many different other elements. We can calculate and model what life would look like when it's made from silicate. And I'm and for me, much of the resource of astrobiology that I ever had was Star Trek, of course, and I hope you remember when in this uh, Star Trek um, one sequel, uh, the silicon-based life form Horta came about. It looked a little bit uh, ugly for us. It was very unfriendly, but uh, of course, humans wanted to deal with it when it was just giving birth to its little silicon children, and 
you know that from all animals, and why should silicon life be different from that? Mothers are just very protective. <laughs> silicon life is not working. We can understand, we can model this, but there is a future of silicon life in the sense that when you go to informatic conferences, when you go to robotics, you can already see that the future holds that parts of us will be made from silicon. Parts of our brains, parts of the way we store data as humans will in the future be based on silicon. So is silicon not part of life? In the geosciences, we are still cooking. We are looking for these elements, the building blocks. We are looking to make life in a way and understand what elements it needs. In the life sciences, this year, there was a big step forward, at least what many life scientists consider a big step forward. So while we still cannot make life from scratch, we can at least think about what does life need as minimum information to live. And uh, this year, a paper was published about this minimum genetic information to have a reproducing cellular life. And when you look at it, it looks a little bit like Horta. It's uh, not very pretty, but it's a bacterium that where you can take basically the cell and the plasma and you can exchange the genome. And in 2010, it was the first time possible to have this outer cell shell to put a completely foreign genome from another bacterium in it. And this year, it was the first time ever shown that we can take a cell envelope and add a fully synthetic genome. Genes composed, genes made from scratch. That's how far it goes in the life sciences to make life. And what was really important is to learn how little we know. We know that we need some 400-something genes with the basic functions of life in them. But we know that a third of them have unknown functions. If we leave them away, the bees will not grow. We need to add some to make it grow. But what are they? What are they doing for the cell? We don't know. So in the life sciences, and here today, geo and life sciences merge, as I will show you in a moment, we are really about hunting genes, hunting for this understanding of what does life need to function. So wherever life started, if it was in the warm little ponds, if it was on hydrothermal vents, or if it flew in from outer space, we have only one concept for life on Earth. And all of that seems very much alike. It's composed of the same elements. And it's composed of five important building blocks that we use partially as biomarkers that we know are important um, for, for life in general, for what we eat, and so on. But just that you understand why it is so interesting when you think about diversity of life and what is common to all forms of life. We have DNA for information, RNA for translation, we have enzyme as machineries, lipids for membranes, ATP for energy, and that's exactly in this artificial organism that for the first time was made up this year. All life is the very same. Your cells and the cells of a weird bacterium from eight kilometers under Earth is the same in this regard. So let me put a bit more in from that perspective of a geomicrobiologist who tries to go out and find new life to actually test this hypothesis that all life is the same. You know that we have tried, we have microscopes longer that we can fly out to outer space. And this picture that you see here is an observation on bacteria that live exactly at this gradient between anoxia and uh, anoxia. So these uh, cells are trying to form little colonies to make sure they are not poisoned by oxygen. So the ones outside are protecting the ones inside. They're all clones of each other, so they have some type of social behavior here. All cells on Earth are adapted to their environments, and all genes of all of that life on Earth still tells the story of adaptation to life on Earth. What is old and what is new and what we don't know today. So we ge geomicrobiologists who would like to understand the interaction of carbon and life our hobby is, and also our work, is to go really far out to think of the most extreme environments and go and search for new forms. Look for the deepest pressures, the coldest temperature, the fringe, the abiotic fringe of life at the hottest temperature, acidic, you name it. We can test all of the conditions that we humans think are extreme, should not be possible for life to, to actually live there. And at least for small single cells, we haven't really found the environment where life doesn't exist, except when we cook it to more than maybe 130, 140 degrees. Then it's cooked, then it's abiotic. 
But other than that, we can find life everywhere. And even if we go under kilometers of glacial ice mass, or even if we go in the deepest uh, parts of the deep sea and even drill subsurface, there is life. And it's amazingly diverse. Let me just uh, mention one big expedition that is currently prepared in the framework of the Deep Carbon Observatory and IODP. An entire IODP expedition dedicated to understanding this biotic fringe, so this area where life has, is pushing the limits. You can imagine that for all the time life had on Earth, more than four billion years, it's not really clear where that limit should be. Maybe it's pushing it further all the time. So where exactly is life um, ending? Here, for example, you can see that cell counts, we can count them under the microscope, suggest there is an area where it's getting too hot at 100 degrees, but then there are some exceptional samples that show cells. So where is it actually? Where does life end in the subsurface? Is one big question that will be researched um, this year. But then when we find and sort all of that life according to its relatedness, we are always reminded to the fact that at the core is the same, old same or they are the proteins, the lipids, the DNA, and the RNA. So to me, one of the greatest concepts, one of the big steps that we all took together, all sciences took together, geosciences and life sciences alike, was when Carl Böse came up with the concept to measure and compare all components of life to form a tree that is objective in the sense that it measures evolution, adaptation of genes. And uh, he died in 2012, and uh, in his lifetime he managed to put together this tree of life where we see three domains of life. And uh, it's a very curious tree. So he was the one who described first that there are some kinds of single cells without, uh, um, a, uh, without a cell nucleus, without a nucleus that protects the DNA. But soon after he also found that this branch is sitting on the branch of the eukaryotes, what we are, and the bacterial branch is, is different. So somehow we found single cell life without a nucleus that is more related to us, and today we are learning much about them. It's a fantastic concept that we can connect all components of the tree of life and look for the last common ancestor to learn how life started. What was mind-boggling really for geosciences and life sciences alike was the problem with the, and still is, is the problem of the archaeal membrane lipids. So the archaeal membrane lipids are completely different with their ether bonds, with their branched hydrocarbons, with some of the most amazing super lipids that you can think of adapted to the full range of temperatures and uh, acidity and alkalinity, but sitting closely related to us on the same branch. How is it possible that inside of the cell is the same for all branches of life, but the envelope is different? We haven't answered that today. What's the story behind this? The current hypothesis is that truly first life evolved had maybe only a mineral shell and only later got this lipid membrane, but this remains to be tested. Today our task is to put all of this information about genes, about branches of life into growing and growing interactive trees of life. It's a shared open access project and all scientists who go out there and either if they find bacteria on humans, on pigs or in the soil or in all of these extreme environments I just showed, we all put the life that we find onto this one big tree. And we are hoping to understand better how life is related and what are the traits for adaptation. So this branch is the most fascinating, as I said, the eukaryotes, including us, and the archaea on one end and all of the bacteria on the other end. I would also like today a little bit about the way we do science. So in most graphs that I show, it's about shared knowledge. All of that knowledge, all of you can access. But I would also like to point out difficulties with some of this shared knowledge. For example, this gigantic work that scientists do today to have the composite tree of life of all genes on Earth to really understand the beginning and the future as well is organized really nicely in open access, but it comes without georeferencing. So if we at some point want to travel back and find out where did all of these things come from and are the actinobacteria that we got in the 80s from Siberia, the same as today, we will have great difficulties because that knowledge is not organized. 
Also, this tree is expanding very rapidly. Now you cannot read anything anymore. This is the tree of life with all of the genomes in it that we have today. Here is the eukaryote, here is the archaea branch. The archaea are rapidly diversifying the better we can address them. And uh, here are the bacteria. The viruses make happen that genes jump between all of them, but we can see the discrepancy. And somewhere out here are humans on this tip of a little branch. This is even newer. So this tree I like very much. Now the tree looks more like a flying dragon also. And uh, again, so because you can't read all of that diversity, it's very freshly published. This is the eukaryotes, and here are some fantastic new branches of archaea that are deeply branching from the origin of the eukarya. These ones were found recently on an Arctic hydrothermal vent, the northernmost vent so far discovered, has these archaea that are close relatives to us, and now we need to understand what makes them related. It's actually the DNA replication machinery that makes us so closely related. The lipids of these are the furthest away you can think of when we compare them to our membrane lipids. So discovery of life on Earth is not finished. We are still ongoing, and it still changes much of the picture that we have of relatedness. Look at something else. Look at the red dots here. All of the red dots show branches of life that have no cultivated members. And isn't that striking? So we have genes, we know proteins and DNA and so on from these, but we can't grow them, so we don't know how they function. If we, don't, if we can't cook something, if we can't grow it, if we can't make it, we don't really understand it. It's the engineer's perspective of understanding, and there is really a lot to do. But then, we can also turn around that picture, and again, I love this paper by Paul Falkowski and his team in 2011. So you go back to the basic functions of life, and it all looks very much alike. In fact, when you put this entire map of functions, you see the world that is the world of photosynthesis, photosynthetic organisms using uh, sunlight as energy, water, and atmosphere with a little bit of nutrients. You have the anaerobic worlds with fermentation, methanogenesis, sulfur respiration, iron respiration. You have something in between parts of the, especially the branches of all the bacteria that have learned to to respire oxygen, including the mitochondria that we host in our eukaryote cells. So there are just a few basic functions for all of that life and all of its diversity. Why all of that diversity is also one of the biggest questions of carbon and life interactions that we haven't well answered. In fact, we can go back and look at one section of the enzymes that cells use as machinery, and we can map all of them that we know of today, a few thousands, and we can look at their relatedness and origin, and what we get is the most ancient predicted metabolism of, even before the cellular envelope was invented, geochemical reactions between iron, sulfur, pyrite, hydrogenase, making the first energy for the cells to grow, maybe really even before they had a membrane. So that's what makes us deep sea researchers always very happy when people think they should look for the origin of life on Earth at our hydrothermal vents, like these fantastic sulfur vents that you see here in the Manus Basin. It's really difficult because all of them are poisoned, contaminated with modern life. How to get to the origin of life at our ecosystems that mimic the ancient uh, situations is very difficult. Again, a big IODP um, um, mission last year tackled this question. So, to confuse you, on the one hand, I've just told you that everything is the same. We have these old ancient, ancient enzyme machineries in the cells, but then we also find things that are new, things that are surprising, and we have to put them on a map. That puts the question forward, what do we actually know about the adaptability of life? Just very recently, a paper was published, and you could see it everywhere in the press, because most people on Earth hate the idea that our environment is littered with plastic, that the first bacteria was found that can hydrolyze plastic bottles. And the scientists showed actually how they do it. They can actually hydrolyze this, put it back into components, respire all of that, turn it to acetate and CO2. Now, the scientists in their article put forward this fantastic question, what is that actually? Is that an enzyme, an enzyme related to enzymes that we knew already, that is, has always been there and finds a specific function, or is this a new adaptation of life to an environment that humans have created? 
How would we answer such a big question? It's, it's really difficult to answer. In fact, we can't. We can look at relatedness and can say, well, it's something that we don't know much of. It seems to be a new branch, but it originates in many of the others. How fast life could actually adapt and change the way it deals with plastic is unknown. We would think it can't, but maybe it can. Now, keeping this in mind, think carbon cycle for a moment. You know where our big carbon reservoirs are, for example, in the ocean, the giant DOC pool. If there would be a bacterium inventing how to tackle humic acids, non-degradable DOC in the ocean, and maybe just eat 1% of the DOC, we would double the CO2 in the atmosphere. So how can we sit still and rely on this fact that bacteria are just the same old, same old types of life and not changing everything in an instant? Do we have a concept for that? Only that we go around and discover what is present on Earth for now. Again, we put all of this in information databases. All of them are open and shared, and everyone who goes out and finds new genes can add them. So we grow and grow this knowledge, but we have little connecting meta-knowledge, as we call it sometimes. So where these organisms were found whose genes we look at is often not reproducible in all of these informations. We are super rapidly growing the amount of information connected with genes, we are so slow in actually adding new enzymes, new proteins that we really know of, where they belong to, what their function is, and how they need lots of other genes to actually grow. And that brings me to the one big concept, and uh, next I will um, go to the completely other end of research questions when it comes to carbon and life interaction. So the one big connecting matter of all of that questions to the origin of life, its uniqueness, but also what it shares has to do with understanding how life and carbon interact, or even a bit wider, how life and the environment interacts. All of what life ever invented, in theory, may still be out there as genes, as forms of adaptations to many of the environments that are still out there. The environment selects which organisms survive and grow, that defines their fitness, and so we have the cycle of evolution where of course, there is adaptation, but much of this hangs on. In fact, we actually don't know if there is a way to really have bacteria go extinct other than you have their hosts go extinct. You know that bacteria live on and in organisms. Every plant, every animal has their own set of bacteria. So one way of getting bacteria extinct is to lose the host, but the free-living bacteria we actually don't know today. Another very big question of carbon life interaction are maybe the oldest genes really present today. So remember this concept, when we know how life functions, what the core of life is, what it's composed of, when we know the environment, we can put together predictions of which organisms get selected and how they again change the ecosystem and how this whole cycle comes to pass. Now I come to the whole other end of question. So the one big question for me, where's life coming from? What's unique to it? What is this puzzle? I would like now to debate with you what are the dynamics of life in the carbon cycle that we need to worry about today and how does this knowledge actually come together in the end? The two furthest uh, pillars of a bridge that I'm trying to span with this outer shell active planet lecture, as you can see. Let's go back to outer space and take the astronauts' perspective. In fact, one of the active, uh, presenta active planet presentations will be one of an astronaut. And when you think about their view on Earth or the view you may have as a remote sensing um, or satellite person that takes data from Earth by looking at it from outer space, it's amazing how landscapes have changed. That's for sure we know and we can measure that. Especially when you look at Earth at night, you can see how it's populated by humans, how giant cities are emerging all around the coastlines. In fact, in a decade, half of these Billions of people inhabiting planet Earth are living close to the coasts and, of course, interacting with ocean and land at the same time. So Earth has completely changed, that we know, and we can get these fantastic pictures telling us how it changes, and we can actually, we have started monitoring this complete picture of Earth today. It's one of the most important components of our Earth observatory to be able to watch Earth from space. Now, when we do that, we can try to monitor function from space. And again, one of the most important functions that we can monitor when it's about the interaction of life and carbon is photosynthesis. I was really amazed when in the preparation of this lecture, I wanted to find out, I asked the question to the internet, what's the most productive landscape 
that we know of today. So not the one productive plant or not the global distribution, but the area, a super ecosystem that is the most productive today. When I was in school, I learned it's tropical rainforests and it's the algae, it's, it's seagrass and algae in coastal zones. Do you know what, who the winner is by now? Actually, it seems that the past 10 years have changed this much. Anyone knows that? The winner is maize, corn. So when you look at uh, the corn belt in the US up here, this is the super ecosystem we have today by certain types of agriculture, innovation, fertilizing, and so on. We have this giant area that is agriculture that is now the most productive ecosystems that we have on Earth. But asking such questions, having this knowledge all together is not easy. I went and asked myself or asked the internet, can I name the 10 most productive ecosystems? Can I actually name them to you which were the 10 most productive 10 years ago or will be in 10 years from now? This information is not put together. We can't have these answers ready. You need to read to thousands of papers and then convert all of the different measures of productivity to, to be able to answer that question. I wrote to 10 important scientists, I won't put names forward, and none of them could actually make that list, put that list together. What are really the most productive organisms? Which plants and animals are changing carbon and nitrogen the most? We, they all answer to me humans, but the, really the ranking list is so hard to put together, which tells us that our knowledge is not in the right place. I put another test for you forward. I was completely surprised by one picture. Mind, I'm a deep sea researcher. Maybe for you it's similar to understand. But just the winners and losers in terrestrial mammal biomass. Anyone who knows? How many humans do we have compared to pigs? <laughs> or chicken or cattle? Half and half, look at that. So A, we have a gigantic amount of carbon in humans, stored in humans. We have double or triple the amount in livestock, and actually the wildlife, wild mammal life is tiny. It's shrinking and shrinking, and we don't know where the end is for that shrinkage of wildlife. So I ask you, this is like completely simple type of knowledge, but maybe none of you in this room would have been able to draw it, and it, I searched forever to get this to this picture and to get to this information. It's so important to understand carbon life interaction. Why is that knowledge not sorted better? That would be a big task for understanding active planet. So I tried to go further and put forward this list of carbon and life winners and losers, which are the species or the groups of organisms today, the functional groups that are winning. For some, we don't even have a number. Look at this list here. This is what we looked at. The wildlife is tiny. Livestock is increasing. Livestock, ants and termites are paired. We don't have that much influence, except that where we have wood determines much where we have termites. Plants, we have a pretty good understanding, partially, but we just know plants overground. We don't know underground plant life, which is a big missing link in carbon storage on Earth. Fungi, this is guesstimated, but the estimates are that this is a complete deep carbon storage organism that we totally overlook in its function and relevance on Earth. These numbers are really hard to estimate, but we also see these fantastic differences between Earth and ocean, where on Earth we need, have many more plants to sustain a bit of livestock and, and wildlife. In the ocean, we have this super rapid cycle of carbon and life where the animals are more abundant than the plankton that they can eat. We also see sad figures like the blue whales once, tiny fraction of carbon, and uh, it was once 36 million tons, uh, they never came back. This fantastic picture of the underground bacteria in Archaea is changing all the time. It goes up and down by threefold. So all in all, this big question of where is carbon in life today and how will it change, which should be one of the most important questions, is really hard to answer and sc screams for a lot of more investigations. But the way that we deal with carbon has, of course, is affecting element cycles and is most of all affecting even more than the carbon cycle, the global nitrogen cycle. I hope that you know this, that whereas in the carbon cycle, we are changing some reservoirs, not at all, some reservoirs we change, we change the atmosphere by certain percentages, the nitrogen cycle, humans have actually changed much more than the natural fraction. The ocean is fixing nitrogen at a really high rate, it's a very important function here, lightning and the nitrogen fixation in soils, together the, with the plants, 
is uh, also important, but the human factor that you see here has doubled or tripled the cycling of nitrogen on Earth. Again, if you ask the question like, where is most of nitrogen today? Which organisms are most relevant in nitrogen cycling? It's really hard to get that information together. This is an area where we need to put our knowledge together in a much more standardized way that we can really monitor those organisms that are important. Let's get to the carbon cycle. In parallel to this session here, there is a session on the anthropogene. There is a session on resources on Earth and how we can better work with them, deal with them, manage them, the carbon cycle gives us a lot of headache today. Here you see only the perturbation of the global, global carbon cycle, and again, the numbers are really important to understand. The fossil fuel that we take from geological reservoirs is, as we all accept today, and even the Rockefeller family does so and has uh, split from Exxon, um, to say that uh, we all have to agree this is uh, not a good idea anymore. Um, here you see what's coming out, and here you see where, where it goes. We have too much ending up in the atmosphere. The ocean takes up as much as it can, and land takes up quite some. Actually, they are most pair, and these are biological processes, and we better know what the future of carbon uptake is. So, Knowing how life functions, how life can adapt, is there a solution by life in all of this? Can there be a better uptake of carbon that gives us more time before it gets even warmer today? That's a big question as well. So this picture that is, again, as the, looking at Earth from outer space, one of these completely mindset-changing pictures that we have in the geosciences of CO2 rising. Look at this time again. So while we were flying to moon, while we were looking at the planet from far away, it was still not, it was here not possible for the scientists to convince anyone that this time series would have that effect when it was started out here. It's so important today to monitor it. We can also, and that's much less talked about, but for me as a student was also totally blowing my mind to see how, how oxygen oscillates, how, how the seasons actually give us a view of Earth, how it respires. So we have a way of monitoring Earth at the extreme output ends, the CO2 and oxygen in the atmosphere, and we know how we humans change it. But what do we know about how life on Earth responds to that? I totally love the effort that Corinne Lecar and her team takes with putting together uh, knowledge to revise the global carbon budget every few years. But still, in this area of knowledge, we are missing too much the response of life, the adaptations of life, the traits of life that will explain how life will respond and how life can help to actually take up more CO2 or what actually the feedback mechanisms are that may be equally worrisome. In this picture, you see on the one hand what we do, so the emissions and the land use change. Actually, land use looks much better today than it did some decade ago. And here you see what is adapting. So there are physical adaptations, simply the ocean taking up CO2 physically, the atmosphere having too much CO2 physically, and the land is actually a subtraction. So we can't really put those numbers, they have a big error and we don't know what's happening here. Think permafrost, melting permafrost. Will the microorganisms waking up in the ice be able to consume the methane or not is one of the big questions that we cannot answer in this regard. So many questions that have to do with life its basic functions, its adaptability and its traits that we have to answer where geosciences and life sciences need to come together and where we need to know the entire suite of genes, environmental dynamics to understand fitness and responses. What we certainly can monitor today is the change in temperature. And uh, I love all of these alerts that we can now get on our iPhones and everywhere and it's amazing to think that for more than 100 years we have now the biggest change, or the, the record again for 100 years in February, and in fact, when you look up the record for the Arctic, uh, from winter to winter, it was plus 10 degrees uh, delta for much of the Arctic compared to the last winters that we look at this winter. What will this do to the ability of organisms to adapt? It's another picture that I need to put forward. I, I, 
have said, I will not talk much about my own data and my own research today, but I can tell you that just being out there on a polar research vessel, being in the ice, and this is a picture from the way that the North Pole looks today in summertime, it really changes your mind and it changes the mindset of students that you take along. This is polar stern going through the ice and it's, it crosses the ice as if it was butter in summertime, at least on the, the eastern part of the Arctic. When we drill a hole into the ice, it takes us less than a minute before we see seawater because how the ice responded was uh, melting from some six meter in a decade to less than one meter. In the ice is life, some of the extreme life that we are researching that, is know, that knows how to grow in the ice, but will it know how to adapt? So when we put this picture together again, the extreme dynamics of the environment for much of which us humans are responsible on this thin outer shell of Earth. When we think about calm and life interaction, the hopes we have that life responds and will take up much of the CO2. We, we really have to get to the grips that the timescales, the dynamics of this change is not in line with what we know, how evolution functions, how genetic adaptation functions. If I change the Arctic by 10 degrees in 10 years in winter time with all of the environmental consequences, this is much faster than genetic adaptation. Selection is the only mechanism that works then, so these organisms that can't adapt will be out-selected, the other ones can continue. And here we have big holes in our understanding. So the last few slides go to the question of the future of life in the carbon cycle. I hope I could give you some more arguments, some more evidence for this fantastic task for the geosciences and the life sciences alike, namely go out, observe, measure, do experiments, try to cook life, but bring all of that together into one big pile of knowledge that we can all look at together. The system states of the active outer shell is what we need to bring together and we have no time to discuss which disciplines are more important or what's the right standard for data. We need to be fast to put that knowledge together, this is clear. And observing is not enough, of course. What we learn from observing, from the dynamics, we need to bring to simulation and analysis and information of society. I told you that questions like what's the type of ecosystem that works well under the given circumstances that can adapt to certain dynamics like dryness or heat or floods. This is very important information and this is constantly changing. This list has changed in the past 10 years and it will probably change in the next 10 years. So we need to bring these data together to get an understanding of the distribution and activity and function and composition of life in these ecosystems. One fantastic way forward is if we have the important, the functional groups of life listed out, if we know their genetic traits, if we know how they can adapt, we can model how they are selected or counter-selected, how they may actually determine future Earth. And this is a video from Mick Follows, who works with the MIT models in a project called Darwin Project, where basically they try to better simulate life on land and in the sea based on what they know as genetic adaptations and uh, selection by environmental dynamics. Diatoms, maybe some of the losers, coccolithophores, we don't know yet, we have diverse information, small tiny plankton life, like cyanobacteria, may actually be the larger winners of the changes that are, occurring, that are uh, happening right now. But there is all of this knowledge that we don't have and we need to follow up with and much of this has to do with hidden life and deep carbon. So for example, going back to land, we can monitor plant life from outer space and we can look at plants and measure them, but all of what is underground is actually probably at least as important and we have no way of monitoring it. Who knows about the adaptation of, of fungi and oils and soils? This is uh, one of the big challenges. And on land, we have the same challenges as uh, in the sea. For example, another fantastic example of a recent finding is that these giant fungi that we have in the soil that connect all of the plants together and can actually transport carbon and elements between plants, a completely new finding that may revolutionize the way we think about soils and what actually drive plants. This is new and this is so important. So don't think that all we can do today is problem solving science. The big discovery of how life responds to carbon, to environmental dynamics is really still in the age of exploration. Two more examples. 
of course, since decades, we are working on the question of what determines, what triggers the CO2 uptake of the ocean and the sinking of carbon to the deep ocean. And again, we made big findings knowing about how different life can be, small life, big life, how it can respond to ocean cha changes, and how this all affects carbon sinking. One of the biggest findings most recently is actually that those phytoplankton that I just mentioned to you, where we think these are the key functional groups doing much of the cycling of carbon, but also the transport of carbon deep down, as the plants have the, the fungal symbionts, all of this big plankton life in the ocean seems to have distinct symbionts that are actually driving much of the adaptability and dynamics of that phytoplankton. Brand new knowledge. We didn't have that 10 years ago. We know that for the copepods, for many of the diatoms, for many of the foraminifera, of the coccolithophores, much of the plankton is actually depending on tiny little other life that is regulating its, um, its function. So, in this wide uh, um, spanning of, of knowledge and, and problems and big questions in carbon life interactions that I tried to make, I would also like to say of one or two more words about us humans. So, ourselves, as much of the life that I talked about today, we are made up from a few elements, but our footprint of elements that determines how we live and how we will live and work and be in the future is completely different. I love this depiction that the children get in school today to understand element tables. So basically all elements on Earth are needed by us in all kinds of different functions and many of them will run out much before some other types of, uh, of uh, resources will run out. For example, gas and oil is not on the list of those soon to run out. Yttrium, for example, may be earlier. This changes also the way we think about Earth and what we need to take from Earth and how this will affect ecosystems. Especially when we think of leaving the old and ugly fossil fuels and turning to living with sunlight, we have big problems to overcome that have to do with the resources, the elements we need to do that. Again, there is a huge task for the geosciences to bring that knowledge together and to look at it in the same way we look about genetic fitness. What is it that we humans need? Where do we take that from? How are we dependent? How does this change the way we, we work and how does this change our society? We can model all of this in the same way and we could get to models and some of this work is starting where we don't even only include the natural sciences but also questions of economy, questions of social organization. It's all about fitness, the dynamics of the environment and how we respond to it. So the tasks that the geosciences look onto today um, that we are dealing with in a series of knowledge uh, lectures about active planet Earth are big. We have many organizations around us that try to bring the right scientific knowledge together for the future and I'm sure you're following all of them or you contribute to some of them but isn't it amazing how we geoscientists should be explorers, how we should put those quantitative information, data together, how we should publish, teach, and do all of this plus service society with all of the big questions of future decisions. So while we are trying to put knowledge together in a way that it's usable by society, which is one of the greatest challenges that we are facing, we have to also stand together in saying that this all cannot be extra in the lifetime of a scientist. It needs a better split of job, it needs more resources, it needs a better support. And this I find very important to mention when it's about that what I've presented today. It's really knowledge that came together for decades by the work of so many scientists and all of that knowledge needs to go and be organized in a more systematic way to really advise and to help making decisions and actions. So while this picture outside is growing, the active planet picture with all of these people showing themselves in the, all of these environments where they do research, um, I hope I entertained you a little bit with my view on the um, active planet outer shell and life and carbon interactions. Thank you for your attention.
that those facts are important for them, which would enable the policymakers to really make long range plans, not build the next election, because then they might make the wrong choice. But convincing people how important it is to make decisions. It's not saving the earth, it is saving society, making people able to survive. Right. So that's part of this question of how we put the right type of knowledge together and what's our role as scientists uh, in that. And I don't know how it is for you, how much of your time you spend on average for just communicating what you have found. It's increasing, the pressure is increasing on all of us, I think, to do more of that. We have to do it to get more funding, we have to do it to explain our families why we are absent, why we are working so hard. Our politicians need to know, and I, I find that in my life it's taken a gigantic role, while in my mind I feel I need much more time to use all of the new methods and tools to go and explore and get that knowledge. And this is difficult. So um, I think the, the problem is that we need to be much more outspoken about the resources that is not only the funding, but also the infrastructure we need for this new type of science. It's, uh, it has to do much with bringing data together in the right way. It has to do with the matter of finding the data back. Just try for a couple of questions that you have in mind to go and find data like, as I said, which organisms are the winners of uh, current environmental dynamics and it's not possible to organize, to have that knowledge present. And so all of that is part of the science that we have to organize and I wish we would have uh, a better support. Actions like this one where we all come together and discuss are good, but um, I I see that we actually are losing in the moment because so many countries in Europe have actually are about to shut down their science. So, so to me, one of the big questions is like, can we do better in, in supporting each other with, with having resources and doing observations, right? There is no one answer to that question of how, how we should put that knowledge, what, what's the most important bit? Is it the public, the politicians, is it us? I don't know. Hi, Jody. Yes, so of course we have much, we have a lot of evidence from all of these genetic uh, comparisons about lateral gene transfer and there is a lot of such transfer going on between all domains. So as humans we have, I don't know, I didn't see a, a recent update of that, but when the first human genome was put together, we saw that we had some 3% bacterial genes and also a fraction of archaeal genes in us. So. This sometimes is, gets interpreted into the idea that everything is possible, but it's actually not. So it's very difficult to transfer genes and implement genes in other organisms' genomes so that they are reproduced and that they survive. And it's actually, to me, more amazing to see how important genes have not been transferred than the other way around. The, the best story of it all is the story about cyanobacteria as chloroplasts in plants. So cyanobacteria are the bacteria, that almost the role model organism that can take sunlight, CO2, fix nitrogen and all of that. They have invaded the plants, they are the chloroplasts, we know that, from endosymbiosis theory and from genetic comparison. They didn't take the nitrogen fixation gene with them or they lost it afterwards, that we don't know. But would plants on Earth, would, ha would they have inherited nitrogen fixation genes? We wouldn't need to fertilize, it would be a completely different planet. Our society would be different just because of that. So why is it not possible that such an important gene that protects you from running out of nitrogen, why is that not widely taken up by all kinds of life? It's not. So my answer is we shouldn't exaggerate. It's really hard to make genes jump and, and change the way that life functions. Yeah, I have to say I'm totally promiscuitive with ideas at that point. <laughs> so whenever I read something new, like uh, very recently that we can make all of the nucleotide components, the sugars, the riboses in outer space in stellar ice, 
and that rains to Earth all the time. I, when I read all of this, I thought, oh, that's just the best explanation. It rains down from outer space and it has then uh, made its living on Earth. So um, the, the new ideas about minerals as surfaces and a mixture of cold and hot and the experiments that have been carried out by different people when they actually add uh, minerals to the broth to the, of life, they are very convincing, but um, that could all happen in outer space, and uh, I, at the moment I feel more spacey than I feel earthy. <laughs> but I have like no other argument that many of the recent papers have shifted our knowledge of all the building blocks coming from outer space, uh, so that I think that is probably likely, but it most likely is a mixture of both. Even the chirality has recently been solved, or partially solved, the problem with chirality of amino acids and sugar, so the outer space uh, science in this has been really critical to change the picture. Hydrothermal vents I don't believe in at all, because they have a lifetime of a hundred years, and I cannot imagine how life emerges on a structure, a geostructure that lasts for a hundred years, and then 20 kilometers away the next geostructure, so all of this is a bit too dynamic for, for me that I could always, even though I'm a deep sea researcher, and I love it when people write, in fact, I just got a NASA robot along on my Polarstern cruise because they argued about the need for searching hydrothermal life under the ice to, that was as cool for me as a deep sea researcher, but I have a hard time understanding that hydrothermal vents would be really the places where life was born. <laughs>